Chapter 13 Hand over your second skin, too. Can you behead a man whose head has already been cut off? You can. Can you skin the hide off a man when he has already been skinned? You can. This was all invented in our camps. This was all devised in the archipelago. So let it not be said that the brigade was our only Soviet contribution to world penal science. Is not the second camp term a contribution to? The waves which surge into the archipelago from outside do not die down there and do not subside freely, but are pumped through the pipes of the second interrogation. Oh, blessed are those pitiless tyrannies, those despotisms, those savage countries, where a person once arrested cannot be arrested a second time, where once in prison he cannot be re-imprisoned, where a person who has been tried cannot be tried again, where a sentenced person cannot be sentenced again. But in our country everything is permissible. When a man is flat on his back, irrevocably doomed, and in the depths of despair, how convenient it is to polax him again. The ethics of our prison chiefs are, beat the man who's down, and the ethics of our security officers are, use corpses as stepping stones. We may take it that camp interrogations and camp court were born on Solovki, although what they did there was simply to push them into the bell tower basement and finish them off. During the period of the five-year plans and of the metastases, they began to employ the second camp term instead of the bullet. For how otherwise, without second or third or fourth terms, could they secrete in the bosom of the archipelago and destroy all those marked down for destruction? The generation of new prison terms, like the growing of a snake's rings, is a form of archipelago life. As long as our camps thrived and our exile lasted, this black thread hovered over the heads of the convicted, to be given a new term before they had finished the first one. Second camp terms were handed out every year, but most intensively in 1937 and 1938, and during the war years. In 1948 and 1949, the burden of second terms was transferred outside. They overlooked, they missed, prisoners who should have been re-sentenced in camp, and then had to haul them back into camp from outside. These were even called repeaters, whereas those re-sentenced inside didn't get a special name. And it was a mercy, an automated mercy, when in 1938 second camp terms were given out without any second arrest, without a camp interrogation, without a camp court, when the prisoners were simply called up in brigades to the records and classification section and told to sign for their second terms. For refusing to sign, you were simply put in punishment block, as for smoking where it wasn't allowed and they also had it all explained to them in a very human way. We aren't telling you that you are guilty of anything, but just sign that you have been informed. In the Colima, that's how they gave out tenors, but in Volkuta, it was even less severe, eight years plus five years by the OSO. And it was useless to try to get out of it, as if, in the dark infinity of the archipelago, eight was in any way distinct from eighteen, or a tenor at the start from a tenor at the end of a sentence. The only important thing was that they did not claw and tear your body today. Now we can understand. The epidemic of camp sentences in 1938 was the result of a directive from above. It was there at the top that they suddenly came to their senses and realized that they had been handing out too little, that they had to pile it on and shoot some too, and thus frighten the rest. But the epidemic of camp cases during the war was stimulated by a happy spark from below, too, by the features of popular initiative. In all likelihood, there was an order from above that during the war the most colourful and notable individuals in each camp, who might become centres for rebellion, had to be suppressed and isolated. The bloody local boys immediately sensed the riches in this vein, their own deliverance from the front.
This was evidently guessed in more than one camp and rapidly taken up as useful, ingenious, and a salvation. The camp checkists also helped fill up the machine gun embrasures, but with other people's bodies. Let the historian picture to himself the pulse of those years. The front was moving east. The Germans were around Leningrad, outside Moscow, in Voronezh, on the Volga, and in the foothills of the Caucasus. In the rear, there were even fewer men. Every healthy male figure aroused reproachful glances. Everything for the front. There was no price too big for the government to pay to stop Hitler. And only the camp officers, and their confreres in state security, were well-fed, white, soft-skinned, idle, all in their places in the rear. This camp godfather, for example, how badly he needed to stay alive. And the farther into Siberia and the north they were, the quieter things were. But we must soberly understand theirs was a shaky prosperity, due to end at the first outcry. Bring out those rosy-cheeked, smart camp fellows. No battle experience, so they had ideology. And they would be lucky to end up in the police or in the behind-the-lines obstacle detachments. But it could happen otherwise. Otherwise, it was into officer battalions and be thrown into the Battle of Stalingrad. In the summer of 1942, they picked up whole officer training schools and hurled them into the front, uncertified, their courses unfinished. All the young and healthy convoy guards had already been scraped up for the front. And the camps hadn't fallen apart. It was all right. And they wouldn't fall apart if the security officers were called up either. There were already rumors. Draft deferment, that was life. Draft deferment, that was happiness. How could you keep your draft deferment? Easy. You simply had to prove your importance. You had to prove that if it were not for Czechist vigilance, the camps would blow apart, that they were a cauldron of seething tar, and then our whole glorious front would collapse. It was right here in the camps in the tundra and the taiga that the white-chested security chiefs were holding back the fifth column, holding back Hitler. This was their contribution to victory, not sparing themselves. They conducted interrogation after interrogation, exposing plot after plot. Until now, only the unhappy, worn-out camp inmates, tearing the bread from each other's mouths, had been fighting for their lives. But now the omnipotent Czechist security officers shamelessly entered the fray. You croak today, me tomorrow. Better you should perish and put off my death, you dirty animal. And so they cooked up a rebel group in Ustgim, eighteen persons. They wanted, of course, to disarm the militarized guard, get its weapons away from it, half a dozen old rifles. What then? It is hard to picture the scale of the plan. They wanted to raise the entire north, to march on Vorkuta, on Moscow, to join up with Mannerheim, and telegrams and reports flew to the top. A big plot had been neutralized. There was unrest in the camps. The security staff had to be strengthened. And what was this? Plots were discovered in every camp. More plots, still more, ever larger in scale, and ever broader. Oh, those perfidious last leggers! They were just feigning that they could be blown over by the wind. Their paper-thin, pelagra-stricken hands were secretly reaching for the machine guns. Oh, thank you, security section. Oh, savior of the motherland, the third section. And a whole gang sat there in that third section in the Jida camps of Buryat, Mongolia, chief of the security operations section Sokolov, interrogator Mironenko, security officers Kalashnikov, Sosikov, Osintsev. We've fallen behind. Everyone else has plots, and we have fallen behind. We do have a major plot, of course, but what kind? Well, of course, the militarized guard is to be disarmed. Yes, of course. They're going abroad. After all, the border was close and Hitler was far away. With whom should they begin? And just as a well-fed pack of hounds tears a sick, skinny and mangy rabbit to bits, so did this sky-blue pack 
hurl itself on the unfortunate Babbage, former Arctic explorer, former hero, now a last legger covered with ulcers. It was he who, at the outset of the war, had nearly turned over the icebreaker Sudco to the Germans, so all the threads of the plot were obviously in his hands. It was his scurvy, racked, dying body that was to save their well-nourished ones. Even if you are a bad Soviet citizen, we will still make you do as we wish. You will kiss our boots. You don't remember? We will remind you. You can't write? We'll help you. You want time to think? Into the punishment cell on ten and a half ounces. And here is what another security man told him. I'm very sorry. Of course, you will come to understand later on that it would have been sensible to do as we demand. But it will be too late when we can break you like a pencil between our fingers. Where do they get this imagery? Do they think it up themselves? Or is there a selection of such phrases in Czechist textbooks composed by some unknown poet? And here is the interrogation by Miranenko. Hardly had they brought Babbage in than he was hit by the smell of tasty food, and Miranenko made him sit quite close to the steaming meat borscht and cutlets. And as though unaware of that borscht and those cutlets, or even that Babbage could see them, He gently cited dozens of arguments to relieve his conscience and justify not only the possibility but also the necessity of giving false testimony. He reminded Babbage amiably, When you were arrested the first time in freedom and tried to prove your innocence, you did not after all succeed, did you? No, you didn't succeed, because your fate had already been decided before your arrest. That's how it is now. That's how it is now. Well, well, eat the lunch. Go ahead, eat it before it gets cold. If you are not stupid, we will get along very well. You will always be well fed and provided for. Otherwise... And Babbage shuddered. Hunger for life had turned out to be stronger than the thirst for truth. And he began to write down everything dictated to him. And he slandered twenty-four people, of whom he knew only four and for the entire period of the interrogation he was fed, but never given enough, so that at the first sign of resistance they could lean on his hunger again. Reading the record of his life, written before his death, sends shivers down your spine, from what heights and into what depths can a brave man fall. Can all of us? And so it was that twenty-four people who knew nothing about anything were taken to be shot or to get new terms. And before the trial, Babbage was sent off to a state farm as a sewage disposal worker, and then gave testimony at the trial, and then was given a new tenor with his previous term erased. But he died in camp before completing his second term. What about the gang from the Jida third section? Well, will someone investigate that gang? Anyone, our contemporaries, our descendants. And you, you thought that in camp at least you could unburden your soul, that here you could at least complain aloud. My sentence is too long, they fed me badly, I have too much work. Or you thought that here you could at least repeat what you got your term for. But if you say any of this aloud, you're done for. You're doomed to get a new tenor. True, once a new camp tenor begins, at least the first is erased, so that as it works out you serve not twenty, but some thirteen or fifteen or the like, which will be more than you can survive. But you are sure you have been silent as a fish, and then you are grabbed anyway? Quite right, they couldn't help grabbing you no matter how you behaved. After all, they don't grab for something, but because... It's the same principle according to which they clip the wool off freedom, too. When the third section gang goes hunting, it picks a list of the most noticeable people in the camp. And that is the list they then dictate to Babbage. In camp, after all, it is even more difficult to hide. Everything is out in the open. And there is only one salvation for a person. To be a zero, a total zero. A zero from the very beginning. To stick you with a charge presents no problem. When the plots came to an end after 1943, 
the Germans began to retreat. A multitude of cases of propaganda appeared. Those godfathers still didn't want to go to the front. In the Bure Polom camp, for example, the following selection was available. Hostile activity against the policy of the Soviet Communist Party and the Soviet government. And what it was, you can guess for yourself. Expression of defeatist fabrications. Expression of slanderous opinions about the material situation of the workers of the Soviet Union. Telling the truth was slander. Expression of a desire hmm, for the restoration of the capitalist system. Expression of a grudge against the Soviet government. This was particularly impudent. Who are you, you bastard, to nurse grudges? So you get a tenor, and you should have kept your mouth shut. A seventy-year-old former Tsarist diplomat was charged with making the following propaganda. That the working class in the USSR lives badly, that Gorky was a bad writer. To say that they had gone too far in bringing these charges against him is out of the question. They always handed out sentences for Gorky. That's how he had set himself up. Skvortsov, for example, in Lok Chimlag, near Ustvim, harvested fifteen years and among the charges against him was the following. He had unfavorably contrasted the proletarian poet Mayakovsky with a certain bourgeois poet. That's what it said in the formal charges against him, and it was enough to get him convicted. And from the minutes of the interrogation we can establish who that certain bourgeois poet was. It was Pushkin. To get a sentence for Pushkin, that in truth was a rarity. After that, therefore, Martinson, who really did say in the tin shop that the USSR was one big camp, ought to have sung praise to God that he got off with a tenor. As ought those refusing to work who got a tenor instead of execution. It was such a pleasure to hand out second terms, and it lent such meaning to the lives of the security operations sections that when the war was at an end and it was no longer possible to believe either in plots or even defeatist moods, they began to paste on terms under non-political articles. In 1947, in the agricultural camp of Dolinka, there were show trials in the compound every Sunday. They tried potato diggers for baking some potatoes in bonfires. They tried people for eating raw carrots and turnips in the fields. What would some nobleman's serfs have said if tried for something like that? And for all this they handed out terms of five and eight years under the recently issued great decree of four-sixths. One former kulak was already coming to the end of his tenor. He was in charge of the camp bull calf, and he couldn't any longer stand to see it starve. He fed this camp bull calf, not himself, with beets, and got eight years for it. Of course, a socially friendly Zek would not have undertaken to feed the bull calf. And that is how in our country over decades natural selection operated, deciding who would live and who would die. But it was not the number of years, not the empty and fantastic length of years, that made these second terms so awful, but how you got them how you had to crawl through that iron pipe in the ice and snow to get them. It would seem that arrest would be a nothing for a camp inmate, for a person who had once been arrested from his warm domestic bed. What did it matter to be arrested again from an uncomfortable barracks with bare bunks? But it certainly did. In the barracks the stove was warm and a full bread ration was given. But here came the jailer and jerked you by the foot at night. Gather up your things! Oh, how you didn't want to go. People, people, I love you. The camp interrogation prison. What kind of a prison will it be, and how can it possibly advance your confession if it isn't worse than your own camp? All these prisons are invariably cold. If they aren't cold enough, then they keep you in the cells in just your underwear. The famous Vorkuta No. 30, a term borrowed by the Zeks from the Czechists, who called it that because of its telephone number, 30, a board barracks beyond the Arctic Circle, was heated with coal dust when it was 40 degrees below zero outside, 
one wash tub full a day, and not because they lacked coal in Vorkuta, of course, and they tormented them with more than that. They didn't issue them matches, and for kindling there was one little chip the size of a pencil. Incidentally, escapees who had been caught were kept in this number 30 stark naked. After two weeks, anyone who had survived was given summer clothes, but no padded jacket. And there were no mattresses and no blankets. Reader, try it. Just try to sleep like that for one night. In the barracks, it was approximately 40 above. And that was how the prisoners were kept throughout the several months of interrogation. Even before that, of course, they had been worn down by many years of hunger and by slave labor. And now it was much easier to finish them off. What did they feed them? As the third section instructed, in some places eleven and a quarter ounces a day, and in some places ten and a half ounces, and in number thirty, seven ounces of bread, sticky as clay, a piece little bigger than a matchbox, and once a day a thin gruel. But you still wouldn't get warmed up right away, even if you signed everything, if you admitted everything, if you surrendered, and if you agreed to spend another ten years in this dearly beloved archipelago. Until your trial, they moved you from number 30 to the Vorkuta interrogation tent, no less famous. This was a plain, ordinary tent, yes, and full of holes to boot. It had no floor. The floor was the Arctic earth. Inside it was seven by twelve yards, and in the center was an iron barrel instead of a stove. There were single-decker lattice bunks on one level, and those next to the stove were always occupied by the thieves. The political plebeians had to sleep around the outside or on the ground. You would lie there and see the stars above you. And you would pray, Oh, the sooner they try me, the better. The sooner they sentence me, the better. You awaited that trial as a deliverance. People will say, no person can live like that beyond the Arctic Circle unless he is fed chocolate and dressed in furs. But in our country, he can. Our Soviet man, our archipelago native, can. Arnold Rappaport spent many months like that. The provincial assizes kept delaying its journey from Narianmar. Or here, for your delectation, is one more interrogation prison, the penalty camp of Orotukan in the Kolima, 315 miles from Magadan. It was the winter of 1937 to 1938, a wood and canvas settlement, in other words, tents with holes in them but overlaid with rough boards. The newly arrived prisoner transport, a bunch of new interrogation fodder, saw even before being led in through the door. Every tent in the settlement was surrounded with piles of frozen corpses on three out of four sides, except where the door was. And this was not to terrify. There was simply no way out of it. People died, and snow was six feet deep, and beneath it there was only permafrost. And then came the torment of waiting. You had to wait in the tents until you were transferred to the log prison for interrogation. But they had taken on too much and too many. They had herded in too many rabbits from the whole of the Kolima, and the interrogators couldn't cope with them, and the majority of those brought here were simply destined to die without even getting to their first interrogation session. The tents were congested. There was no room to stretch out. You lay there on the bunks and on the floor, and you lay there for many weeks at a time. Do you really call that congestion? responds the Serpentinka. Here yeah, they wait to be shot. True, only for several days at a time, but standing the whole time in a shed, so that when they give them a drink, that is, throw pieces of ice over their heads from the doorway, it is so crowded that it is impossible to stretch out a hand to catch the pieces, and instead you have to try to catch them with your mouth. There were no baths, nor any outdoor exercise periods in the fresh air. Bodies itched, everyone scratched frantically, and everyone kept on searching for lice in padded cotton breeches, padded jackets, shirts, underwear, shorts. But they searched without undressing because of the cold. The big, white, bloated lice reminded you of plump, suckling piglets.
and when you crushed them, they splashed your face, and your nails were covered with itchor. Before lunch, the duty jailer would shout through the door, Are there any stiffs? Yes. Whoever wants to earn a bread ration, drag them out. They were dragged out and placed on top of the pile of corpses, and no one bothered to ask the names of the dead. The bread rations were issued on the basis of the total count, and the ration was ten and a half ounces, and one bowl of gruel a day. And they would also issue humpbacked salmon rejected by the sanitation inspector. It was very salty. You were very thirsty after it, but there was never any hot water, never, just barrels of icy water. You had to drink many cups to quench your thirst. G.S.M. used to try to persuade his friends, Turn down the humpbacked salmon. That's your only salvation. You spend all the calories you get from your bread on warming that icy water inside you. But people simply couldn't turn down a piece of free fish, so they kept on eating it and then drinking, and they trembled from inner cold. M. himself didn't eat it, so it's he who now tells us about Orotukan. It was so congested in the barracks, yet it kept steadily thinning out. After a certain number of weeks, the survivors of the barracks were driven outside for a roll call. In the unaccustomed daylight, they saw one another, pale, their faces overgrown with stubble, beaded with knits, hard, dark blue lips, sunken eyes. They called the roll by file cards. The answers were barely audible. The cards, to which there was no response, were put aside. And that is how they established who was left there in the piles of corpses, avoiding interrogation. All who survived Orotukan say they would have preferred the gas chamber. The interrogation? It proceeded according to the plans of the interrogator, and those in whose cases it didn't are not about to tell us. As the security chief Komarov said, All I need is your right hand to sign the testimony. Well, yes, there were torches, of course, homemade and primitive. They would crush a hand in the door, and it was all in that vein. Try it, reader. The court? Some sort of camp collegium. This was a permanent camp court subordinate to the provincial court, like the people's court in the district. Legality was triumphant, and there would be witnesses booked by the third section for a bowl of gruel. In Bure Polom, the brigadiers often testified against their brigade members. The interrogator, a Chuvash named Krutikov, forced them to. Otherwise I will remove you from your position as brigadier and send you to Pechora. And so a brigadier named Nikolai Ronjin from Gorky stepped forward to testify. Yes, Bernstein said that Singer sewing machines were good and that Podolsk sewing machines were bad. Well, that was enough enough at least for the assizes of the Gorky Provincial Court. Chairman Bukonin and two local Komsomol girls, Zhukova and Korkina. Ten years. In Borepolom there was also a smith, Anton Vasilievich Baliberdin, local from Tonshayevo, who used to be a witness at all camp trials. Should you run into him, please shake his honest hand. Well... And then finally, there was one more prisoner transport to another camp to make sure you didn't take it into your head to get even with the witnesses against you. This was a short transport, four hours or so, on an open flat car on the narrow-gauge railroad. And then it was into the hospital. And if you could still put one foot in front of the other, tomorrow, first thing in the morning, you'd be pushing a wheelbarrow. All hail the Czechist vigilance which saved us from military defeat and saved the security officers from the front. Few were shot during the war, if we exclude the republics from which we retreated in haste. And for the most part, new terms were passed instead. What the Czechists needed was not the annihilation of these people, merely the disclosure of their crimes. The convicted could then labor or they could die. This was a matter of economics. In 1938, there was an extreme impatience to shoot on the part of the higher-ups. They shot as many as they could in all the camps, but they shot the most in the Kolima, the Garyanin executions, and in Vorkuta, the Kashketin executions.
The Kashketin executions were tied up with the skin-grating name of the old brickyard. That was what the station of the narrow-gauge railroad twelve miles south of Vorkuta was called. After the victory of the Trotskyite hunger strike in March 1937 and the deception perpetrated on its participants, the Grigorovich Commission was sent from Moscow for investigation of the strikers. South of Ukhta, not far from the railroad bridge across the Ropcha River in the Taiga, a long stockade was set up and a new isolator, Ukhtarkar, was created. This is where the interrogation of the Trotskyites of the southern section of the trunk railroad line was conducted. And Commission member Kashketin was sent to Vorkuta itself. Here he dragged the Trotskyites through the interrogation tent. They were flogged with whips. And without even insisting that they admit their guilt, he drew up his Kashketin lists. In the winter of 1937 to 1938, they began assembling at the old brickyard the Trotskyites, and also the Detsisti, the Democratic Centralists, from various concentration points, from tents at the mouth of the Siryaga, from Kochmes, from Sivaya Maska, from Ukhtarka, some of them without any interrogation whatever. Several of the most prominent were taken to Moscow in connection with trials there. By April 1938, the rest of them at the old brickyard numbered 1,053 persons. In the tundra, off to the side of the narrow-gauge railroad, stood a long old shed. They began to settle the strikers in it, and then, as additional groups arrived, they also set up next to it two tattered old tents, which had nothing to reinforce them, for 250 persons each. We can guess what the conditions were from what we know about Orotakon. In the middle of the six-by-twenty-yard tent like that stood one gasoline drum in place of a stove, for which one pail of coal per day was allotted, and in addition the Zeks would throw their lice in to add a little to the heat. A thick layer of hoarfrost covered the inside of the canvas wall. There were not enough places on the bunks, and the Zeks took turns lying down and walking. They were given ten and a half ounces of bread a day and one bowl of gruel. Sometimes, though not every day, they were given a piece of codfish, there was no water, and they were given pieces of ice as part of the ration. It goes without saying, of course, that they were never able to wash themselves, and that there was no bath. Patches of scurvy appeared on their bodies. But what made this more oppressive than Orotukan was that they sicked on the Trotskyites, the camp stormtroopers, thieves, murderers included, who had been sentenced to death. They were instructed that these political bastards had to be squeezed, in return for which the thieves would get relaxation of their sentences. The thieves set to with a will to carry out instructions so pleasant and so completely to their taste. They were named monitors and assistant monitors. The nickname of one has been preserved, Morots, Frost, and they went around with clubs beating up these former communists and mocking them in every way they knew, compelled them to carry them piggyback, grabbed their clothes, defecated in them, and burned them in the stove. In one tent, the politicals hurled themselves on the thieves and tried to kill them, but the thieves raised an outcry, and the convoy opened fire from outside to protect the socially friendly elements. It was, above all, this humiliation by the thieves that broke the unity and will of the recent strikers. At the old brickyard, in cold and tattered shelters, in the wretched, unwarming stove, the revolutionary gusts of two decades of cruelty and change burned themselves out. And the Russian tradition of political struggle also, it seems, lived out its last days. Nonetheless, thanks to the eternal human trait of clinging to hope, the prisoners in the old brickyard waited to be sent to some new project. For several months they had endured agonies there, and it was quite unbearable. And then, truly, early on the morning of April the 22nd, we are not fully certain of the date, but that, after all, was Lenin's birthday. They began to assemble a prisoner transport of 200 persons. Those summoned were given their bags, which they placed on sledges. The convoy guards led the column east into the tundra, where there was no dwelling nearby, though Salekhard lay in the distance. The thieves rode in back on the sledges with the things. Those who remained behind noticed only one unusual thing— Occasionally bags would fall off the sledges, 
but no one bothered to pick them up. The column marched along in good spirits. They were expecting some kind of new life, some kind of new activity, which even if fatiguing would be no worse than all that waiting. The sledges had fallen far behind. The convoy itself began to fall behind, no longer ahead or at their sides, but only at their rear. So what? This laxity of the convoy was a good sign. The sun shone. Then, all of a sudden, rapid machine gun fire began to descend on the black moving column of Zex from invisible emplacements from out of the blinding snowy wastes. Some prisoners started to fall, while others still stood, no one understanding a thing. Death came in sunny and snowy garments, innocent, merciful. All this was a fantasy on the subject of the coming war. From snow-covered temporary emplacements, the murderers rose up in their arctic cloaks, they say the majority of them were Georgians, and ran to the column and finished off with revolvers, all those still alive. Not far off were the previously prepared pits to which the newly arrived thieves began to drag the corpses. To the chagrin of the thieves, the dead men's things were burned. On the 23rd and the 24th of April, another 760 persons were shot in the same place in the same way, and 93 were transported back to Vorkuta. These were the thieves and evidently the stooly provocateurs. The names of some of them were Reutemann, Isniuk, Model, an editor in Gozlidistad, Aliyev, and one of the thieves was called Tadik Nikolaevsky. We cannot say for sure precisely why each of them was spared, but it is hard to imagine any other cause. Such were the main Kashketin executions. I collected this information from two Zeks with whom I was imprisoned. One was there and had been spared. The other was a very inquisitive person who at that time was passionately determined to write the whole story and who had been able to see these places by tracking down the warm trails and questioning whoever he could about it. But some transports of condemned Zacks arrived too late, and they continued to arrive with five to ten people at a time. A detachment of killers would receive them at the old brickyard station and lead them to the old bathhouse, to a booth lined with three or four layers of blankets inside. There the condemned prisoners were ordered to undress in the snow and enter the bath naked. Inside, they were shot with pistols. In the course of one and a half months, about 200 persons were destroyed in this way. The corpses were burned in the tundra. The old brigade shed and Uktarka were burned down, and the bath was put onto a railroad flat car and taken to the 191st mile post of the narrow-gauge railroad and dumped. There it was found and studied by my friend. It was saturated with blood on the inside, and its walls were riddled with holes. But the executions of the Trotskyites did not end there. Some thirty or so others who had still not been shot were gradually assembled and then executed not far from number thirty. But this time it was done by other people, and the first detachment of killers, those Czechists and convoy guards, and also those thieves who had participated in the Kashketin executions, were also shot soon afterward as witnesses. In 1938, Kashketin himself was awarded the Order of Lenin for special services to the party and the government, and one year later he was shot in Lefortovo. Nor could one say this was the first time this had happened in history. A. B. Blank V. has told how executions were carried out at Adak, a camp on the Pechora River. They would take the opposition members with their things out of the camp compound on a prisoner transport at night. And outside the camp compound stood the small house of the third section. The condemned men were taken into a room one at a time, and there the camp guards sprang on them. Their mouths were stuffed with something soft, and their arms were bound with cords behind their backs. Then they were led out into the courtyard, where harnessed carts were waiting. The bound prisoners were piled on the carts from five to seven at a time and driven off to the Gorka, the camp cemetery. On arrival, they were tipped into big pits that had already been prepared and buried alive. Not out of brutality, no, 
It had been ascertained that when dragging and lifting them, it was much easier to cope with living people than with corpses. This work went on for many nights at Adak, and that is how the moral political unity of our party was achieved.